still nothing.
Okay, so I'm going to ask everyone on YouTube. Y'all, audio, I just made it live now. We were talking about all you guys, uh, all you folks. Um, can everyone hear us now? I'm going to ask, can everyone hear me now? There it is. Okay, good. Yes, we've got audio. We're good there. Very cool. So, can you see the live stream on the moon stream there on YouTube, Dave? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to. I'm trying to get to. I don't know why my phone. Okay. okay, there it is. Awesome. Let me click onto it. I'm trying to get to it via, um, the via Twitter on my phone. Yeah. Uh, okay. Gotcha. Yeah. So now I have it feeding back to Perfect. you. Perfect. So it's, well, it's really a good. feedback loop of video. <laughs> We're gonna cause the, the matrix loop. to break now. So. Cool. So can you have that running over there. Oh, I see the tweet stream too. Yeah. So, okay, cool. So we've got that. Um, what, are, what are you viewing through? What kind of equipment? Okay, yeah. So I'm using a 12-inch um, Richie Cretien uh, telescope. Um, awesome. Yeah, so it's like this is as far away as I can get. And so this is basically the view we're going to have. Um, and I'm also using an infrared uh, filter. So this is 720 nanometer IR. Um, it cuts through. So you get a very small field of view. Very small, very small. So we can like we can move around. We can do lots of stuff. No, I'm um, sorry, Ron. Uh, we cannot see the whole moon through my telescope just because um, it's too yeah. big. It's too big of a telescope. Um, I I need a different camera on it. So I've only got this. It's the optical configuration. Yeah, with the the generates yeah. a smaller field of view. It's this isn't meant for a wide field. Yeah. 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 You actually get a better view with like a small refractor or something that would give you a full view. But yeah. This is good for. Yeah. So right. You now, get to see all the turbulence. So that's yeah. always cool. Yeah. It, it's there's quite a bit right now. It's still mm, kind of low. It's only about I would say 40 degrees above the horizon now, and it's just it's, after sun sunset it's so. like it's like when we used to do the uh the virtual star party and i used to have a homemade webcam that we'd hook up to my uh yeah right. still this is still up online you can see it for posterity yeah uh, the homemade the homemade webcam hooked up to the eight inch uh smith cassegrain the field of view it was like 10 arc minutes across so it was very similar to what you you've got now yeah where you just see a chunk of the moon like you just aim at the limb where the craters are and stuff you, you couldn't get a full moon moon view with it. Yeah. So it was I just, meant for it was meant for a planetary target. Oh yeah, for, exactly. Like, I remember the first time we did this, I, I was using my old Dobson and I was pushing it around by hand. You know, I had the little tiny I remember that. Little remember tiny that. Uh, webcam yeah. that I that I'd um, that I'd modified for that use, and I was pushing the Dobsonian around by hand. I remember Fraser freaking out because he's like, "I can't believe you're actually tracking this by hand while we're while we're, you know." That was <laughs> that was back in the Google Hangout when there was still Google Plus. Yeah. Way back in the day, when there was still Google Plus around. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> way back when. Oh man, Google Plus and the, well, we the... still call it's funny. We say we still call them Hangouts, but there's yeah. no Google Plus Hangouts anymore. Yeah, they're so not. At everybody's all. gonna. F Everybody's gonna forget why we say Hangout, just yeah. like podcasts. There, there's no iPods anymore, but we still say podcasts. So exactly. Pretty soon, like a, a, a few decades from now, we're like, why do we call them Hangouts? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, so for people who are watching now, um, uh, this is on my YouTube channel, so this is me, obviously. But then this is also a guest over there. That's David Dickinson. He's um, he's an author. He's a uh, He's a writer. He does all kinds of space things. Um, he's a drinker of beer and eater of pasta, all kinds of good stuff. Um, Let me get a beer. Hang yeah. on. I'll be and right so if, uh, we, it's, you know, it's lockdown pandemic it's legal beer mode, time, so. so let's do this. It's going to be nice. I need to get a beer sponsor for this. But anyway, it's free, so it's no sponsors here. So anyway, yeah, so Dave... Um, Dave Dickinson, um, we go way back to many, many, many years ago, um, where we used to do these these live virtual star party. Um, we called them Hangouts when Google Hangouts just started, and Dave was one of the first ones with us, with me and Fraser Kane from Universe Today, and um, so me and Dave and and Fraser would set up, um, I don't know stuff, and I guess I was I was part of the part of that group and Dave was there from the beginning and yeah so we go way back um, actually I remember back in was it 2018 now geez it's been a, almost two years now uh, when, we, when we did that uh, the eclipse. eclipse yeah 
So that was that was amazing with Frazier when we did. Yeah, it was me, you, and Frazier. Yeah, that was that was pretty cool. That yeah. was a long, like three hour. <laughs> oh, that was six hours. Six hours, man. Six hours. Yeah. yeah, we were on there for a while. We had a lot of airtime to kill. We did. Yeah, I did. One, but... I did this uh, stream uh, two two days ago, um, similar to this, and it was three hours and forty five minutes. It was more like a more like a test to see if my whole system would you know work and. And everything. The track that long? Well, it's it, no, no. The tracking was horrible. Uh, the polar alignment was out. The moon was moving around. I was just like testing the software yeah. to see how the streaming software was going to work, um, just to see. And it, it seems to be. Well, I fixed the polar alignment quite a bit, so it's working much better now. Um, so I don't have to constantly move it around. Yeah, because the moon is moving slightly. I think it's like it moves its own diameter maybe once an hour. I believe it is. So yeah, no. It, it, it's moving a little bit in its orbit too, not just the Earth rotating. So you got to. It's enough that you have to compensate for it on a long, yeah. long tracking exposure. I, I just realized yeah, the, I have it on the wrong tracking rate anyway, and now it should be better. Hopefully it's a little better even. But, um, yeah. yeah, like, so this is a live image, a video image of the moon through my telescope in South Africa, um, in my backyard. And... Um, yeah, this is the, the, the perigee moon. The moon reaches its closest perigee point, closest to the Earth, eight hours prior to full. Um, I think in a few hours, I had it written down. I talked about it earlier today. Okay. So, and it's it's a slightly closer perigee than normal, too. So it's it's what they call a proxygean or king tide moon. So yeah. so the tidal variations might be interesting here in Norfolk because we have, we have tidal flooding usually downtown. I noticed jogging yesterday the the water was up quite a bit uh, in the downtown area so uh, the, the tidal variation is probably bit bigger than normal right really now, so. okay oh, interesting yeah. so it does yeah have you an get effect. what's called Small a syzygy effect where the, the the sun and earth and moon are lined up so the okay. the uh, the effect the tidal effect of the moon is added to the sun right now so okay. you get especially high variation you get this near every new and full moon but but with sure. the moon being especially closer, uh, than usual here right near perigee you, you get when perigee lines up with full moon or new moon the, the tidal variation is a little higher too so okay this happens a couple times a year okay and of course it's the hashtag super moon yeah these the, the, the pink know. pink super moon, you know? so <laughs> anybody um somebody asked early on in the in the comments they, they asked um you know why isn't the moon pink you know like or, or rather will we be able to see the color and and yeah. someone someone else answered, which was fine, but that's just the name. They just give it the name, you know. I, I feel yeah, I feel like April we should. Man. If we didn't have YouTube um, uh, music restrictions, I'd have Nick Drake in the background. Um, and for the, <laughs> all the music fans out there, you know, yeah, Nick the, Drake, Pink Moon the, album. The, 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 the seasonal moon names we adopt from the, uh, the yeah. Algonquin Native American names. Yeah. So you have like the wolf moon in the pink moon and egg moon and the, the and this egg is moon. also the this this is the moon that this is the easter moon because easter comes up in roman catholic church easter right is this coming sunday this is the full moon past the vernal equinox so the easter the sunday after this full moon which is next sunday that's how the church also calculates it's Easter and sunset tomorrow night is Passover. That's linked into the same Passover always comes before Easter. So that, okay. that ties in with the full, the full moon as well. So, um, uh, something happened to my YouTube stream or did I just make, I it still cool? see, Oh, it just, yeah. I noticed it just went. It oh minimized. no, I see it now. Okay. No, it's, it's there. I accidentally mi minimized it. Oops. The full moon is actually a bad time to look at the moon because everything is uh, the illumination is right directly onto the moon, so there's not really a lot of shadow. Yeah, well, and that's why anything. I've got the that's why I've got it here. I'll move it around a little bit. Um, to You're kind of on the Terminator, yes. Yeah, so you get a little if bit there of is, uh, yeah. If Terminator there is a little, edge. oh, I noticed up at the top, so we'll definitely see it here now. Check this out. This is really really cool stuff. Um, We'll oh, I think I see where your position is. Yeah, kind of trying to... check this out. You'll see it right now coming through. So I don't know what those are, what you know, what mountains those are, what where that is. Um, we can actually look at it. We might be able to tell with your moon atlas. But um, that's actually the reason. Um, the reason I got Dave in here. One, he's he's a friend of mine. But two, he's um, you know he's a, he's a moon nerd. He knows he knows this stuff. I just know how to use the telescope and take the photos and. The I know the bigger you know? craters. I, I I have to resort to a map for the more uh, unfamiliar craters. I don't even and know right the big ones. <laughs> the, 
the lunar the lunar limb there tends to be a lot of rare rare or, or less well-known yeah. craters i guess you could say i think you're up toward like grimaldi and gassendi it looks like am i yeah i'm i'm using i'm using these nasa printed like ginormous maps that i have these are pretty i use these in the field too that's they're pretty handy okay. to, to uh to try to get my bearings on the moon and the moon looks different when it's illuminated at different times like it's first quarter and crescent and a lot of familiar features that i know toward first quarter and crescent moon are kind of harder to look at one thing you do see and i see kind of the edge of one of the image you can see a crater ray there uh kind of it looks like like rays of sunset only those are streaming off the ejecta blanket from the craters yeah which um, one is that i'm trying to figure out i'm is not that, sure it, i think it's it tycho i think be... it's tycho let's look we're gonna move it over oops wrong way okay yeah it might give me a sense it is uh, it's tycho yes it's tycho oh okay that's that's rays from tycho interesting so they're then, that far over yeah so then this let's see is gonna be it's really see yeah this is where we have I these see games it. yeah that big crater right there that is that is Tycho. Yeah. oh there we go okay so yeah Cassatus and Klaparov. ooh that sounds like a Klingon name of some sort <laughs> um, so let's look at these let's see I'm gonna put them in the center so people whoa whoops sorry about that I gotta bring the moon back I uh, got a little carried away <laughs> This is what happens during a live stream. Yeah. Oops. Well, I know it's it's difficult to, to try to narrate and do everything and, and interact with people and operate the telescope. And I was kind of glad during the virtual star party, it's like all I'm really doing is operating the telescope yeah. and maybe doing a little narration as far as the interacting with social media and doing all that. It's like I generally didn't have to. Frazier and Pamela would do all that. So. Yeah. I need to make this. There we go. Okay, I'm back. Okay. Sorry about that. I pushed the wrong button on the toe. No problem. That happens. No, I keep these live streams. I'm not serious about these live streams. It's like, you know, I'm doing this because it's fun. I'm drinking a beer. Yeah. I don't really care. This is like, I want to educate people and just show them what I can see through my telescope. Because, like, everything at home. Uh, Ameri what are you drinking? American and, pa American and Pale Ale. I think it's our last can of beer that we have okay in, in our, see i've got to be careful. in our supply in our stockpile so i'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> drinking a vintage draft right now and um i gotta be careful okay. because i can't replenish my supply during our lockdown here in south africa um alcohol sales is illegal so oh really yeah so wow. i can't i can't buy any more beer until uh, <laughs> april 16th well you know you know most of the restaurants here because every everybody's doing curbside takeout but um, they relaxed the Virginia laws here that usually restaurants couldn't do takeout beer. But a lot of the alcohol vendors were saying, well, we're losing business because nobody's going to restaurants. So they, they relaxed and allowed oh. restaurants to do takeout alcohol, which isn't a usual thing here. So Okay. So if we can so, see, yeah. so right pretty much dead center in the screen, there's two, there are two craters. Um, that look like they're connected. One's kind of in inside the other, and then there's another little tiny one inside. I need to be able yeah, to yeah, use, yeah. I wish I could use my mouse pointer on that, but I can't. Um, I'll leave it there and see if it pops up. I don't think it will. Anyway, um, so. You can tell the moon's not precisely full. I mean, it, it's, it yeah, never it's really perfect. gets. Yeah. Full moon, I always tell people, it's a precise moment too. Yeah. So it's uh, when the moon is opposite to the sun. Uh, and exactly opposite because when it is we don't have a lunar eclipse this this cycle around so yeah. the moon is never actually a hundred percent full yeah so that um let's see i need to put that in the center perfectly so the that crater in the center that's got the little tiny one in the middle of it um i is, see that it's called cassatus and i don't know anything about it other than that's its name but the one next to it the one it looks like they're connected like you know like a snowman yeah, or something yeah. on its side that one's called klaproth and i just like the name because it just seems klaproth it just seems it's interesting pretty cool you know <laughs> uh, i'm gonna look up i am gonna look up klaproth because i'm curious about that okay because i'm just gonna google this 
Google on Google. We're using so many Google utilities right now. They own us. Clap. Yeah. Raw. Because yeah, those those craters right around, and you and sometimes you see the moon librates a little bit uh, by about. Uh, we actually see more than fifty percent of its surface. Mm -hmm. that it's it's rocking back and forth as it orbits. So we see some stuff around the the limb of the moon uh, that sometimes you see during different lunations, and sometimes you don't. Yeah, it actually librates and it notates. So it, it's it's actually a you, we actually see I believe it's sixty percent of the moon's surface from the Earth. So the basically, data, um, Dave, Dave just used. I'm going to interrupt you, Dave, because people are going to be like, "What the hell is, um, you know, vibrate <laughs> and, and whatever the other word Libration was." Vibration and notation. Yeah, basically, what he means is it wiggles. <laughs> yeah, it's it's two it different like axes. This. It's like as so. A, this is the moon, a... okay, and it goes like this slightly yeah. in, in its orbit, <laughs> and that's why. And we... you can see it. You can see animations if you Google libration. There, there's animations of how the moon. It kind of makes more sense when you see it. Yeah. Um, yeah. The moon has one face locked toward the Earth, so meaning that the moon does rotate. Some people say it doesn't rotate. It rotates, but it rotates once every 29.5 days, which is one synodic period okay. from going from back from one phase to the next. So its rotation right. is equal to, and and it's the Earth is gravitationally locked the moon facing. Yeah. So it always keeps one. We didn't see that far face until I believe it was Luna. Three was a Soviet mission in the 50s that flew by the moon, looked back, and took some amazingly, by today's standards, crappy images <laughs> of the far side. Uh, the, the, but they were, they were the first images. When you, you look at these, it's like there, there was almost no detail. Yeah. You could see some of the Maria, and that was it. But, yeah. yeah. Um, and I did not know this till recently. I was reading an article. Somebody, when that Soviet mission did that flyby, it actually used captured u.s air force film to do the photos that, that's i thought i had heard everything about these missions i had never heard that but it was actually they had some uh film from i believe one of our spy balloons or something that we were using and this film was x-ray hardened radiation hardened everything it was ideal so the soviets used that film actually to take those first photos in the space because this back in the old days where everything was done uh photo and that was it was broadcast back you know by radio like uh, the, the image quality was really terrible the line by line scanning of the image and everything yeah uh, was, oh my goodness was sent back by tele by by television video yeah but, um yeah i'd never heard that story till recently yeah oh wow so we're gonna do i'm gonna do something here um where i've got that crosshair on the moon that is the crater i'm talking about klaproth and i did a quick google search Crater. So this crater from the middle of that crosshair is 113 kilometers wide, and it is what did I say? 3,000 meters. So th so yeah, 3,000 meters deep. So okay, three kilometers deep. deep. <laughs> it's just, it's insane if you think about it. I mean, it's, yeah. So we'll do a, we'll, what we'll do is we'll zoom in real quick on it. So it's right in the middle. That one right there. <laughs> It'll pop in and change. It's going to be interesting when this pops in because it's going to be full screen. It'll be huge. Come on now. <laughs> and sorry, uh, I cannot. Um, I cannot zoom out. So right there. Yeah. Now, I'll zoom back out to the normal. normal field of view and we can move around it's hard to get your bearings on the moon sometimes when you're it looking is. really close in it is yeah two nights ago um, we got some really nice views um just because it was you know still quite a bit uh on the one side that hadn't been illuminated yet so i'm going to move over to tycho now and so now we are on tycho and we can I, I know I know some people uh, some some of us pedantic types say Tico, but I think really? Tycho or Tico. Yeah, I've I've heard it pronounced both ways. But ah. it's like if you say Tycho, I know what you're talking about. So, ah. <laughs> like, I'm gonna I'm gonna disagree with that. <laughs> it's like it's like globular versus globular cluster. Oh geez. Or, uh, that old, yeah. Let's see how many other there there are hundreds of uh of 
astronomical arguments as mm. far as pronunciations, but it's like it, Beetlejuice was a good one that sparked a lot of what because of Beetlejuice brightening and fainting of uh, there, there is probably half a dozen different ways to say it, but I always tell everybody says Beetlejuice because of the movie now. So I always tell people if, if you say Beetlejuice, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> so. Oh, here we go. Cool. So, so now Tycho, uh, I'm gonna call it Tycho just because. Um, there's actually a cool band called Tycho as well. And um, anyway, so Tycho is what 85 kilometers in diameter. Um, not quite as big as Klaproth, but it's much more. Much more popular. Um, yeah, yeah. You know. So, yeah. Tycho was in 2001 Space Odyssey, too. That's where they found the monolith. I believe the book and the movie were the same. They departed a little bit. Okay. But the, uh, that's that's where the, uh, the first, well, the monolith that sent the signal out was in Tycho Crater. Okay. Yo, I'm adjusting the telescope a little bit now. Um, I remember, yeah, so the other night, one of the things, I'll be adjusting focus throughout the night. I've got a motorized focuser, so I don't have to touch the telescope, but... Oh, that's always handy. Yeah, it's nice, but, um, yeah, it does change. It does change. The focus changes with temperature and everything. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that's... Tycho, I think, is a pretty young crater, too. I mean, with the rays and stuff, and there's not a lot of... They can date craters kind of by if there's a lot of overlap, like you see a lot of other impact craters on top of it. You know, yeah. it's a pretty old crater. Okay. I think Tycho's pretty pretty new. Okay. And, I mean, it's quite like, famous, you know, I suppose. New being people. millions of years old, but yeah. still. <laughs> new and millions, I like it. Yeah. I gotta, I'm, I'm checking my social media to see if I need to do anything here. Yeah, no, it looks fine. So, and of course, there's discussion about the the Artemis initiative and going back to the moon, and everybody's been talking about. Um, there's been some discussion about whether they're going to do the the lunar gateway currently. That they, there's some talk. I kind of would be disappointed if they don't do it. I thought lunar gateway was a neat little idea to have an orbiting outpost, or kind of like uh, oh. International Space Station Redux. Yeah, that would orbit would orbit the moon and then missions would go down to the surface from that well like listen small... you, you need it though because um you know they talk about space flight a lot and and i'm not going to try and be fraser and, and you and like know about how the space you know yeah. space travel works and everything but i mean we always talk about um the costs and you know the biggest thing the hardest thing about space travel is getting out of the gravity well of a planet yeah. or or in, or any sort of you know celestial body and if you if you're in orbit around the Earth or Moon, you know you kind of have to take off from there rather than than the Earth's surface because it's like you hardly need any of the fuel in comparison. So, yeah. you know you can slingshot yourself. Yeah, and and <laughs> I, I think it gives us more of a permanent presence yeah. there. Um, and I think if they if they decide to do away with it, we're kind of going back to just the flags and footprints kind of mission. That is just my opinion. Yeah. Where it's like, well, why? Why really go back to the moon to do that? I I kind of wonder if we're really going to do it right now. It's like, uh, you know, the SLS still hasn't got off the this is my own space hundred tree, but the SLS rocket hasn't cut off yet. Yeah, um, that's been plagued with a lot of. Uh, I hope we do it. I mean, you know, regardless of it, seems like every administration we switch from, we're going to Mars, we're going to an asteroid, we're going to the moon. <laughs> Ultimately, I think most of us just want to go somewhere. Yeah. So I would, we would get behind it if they want to do it, but it's uh, I'm yeah. I'm kind of in a wait and see. Yeah. See, we we grew up in the Apollo era. I'm over 50 years old, so it's but we were told by 2020 we were supposed to be living on Mars, and it's like it's a uh, it kind of slowed down a little bit. Yeah. Well, speaking of Apollo, let's look at. Um... Let's go look at some of the landing sites, the Apollo landing sites. Yeah, those are always requested, yeah, when I'm doing oh, star parties yeah, and stuff. It's like, okay, what are we looking at now? What are we looking at now? Oh, the, that, that's another, well, we're going to skip that crater for now. We'll go back to that one. I think that's Copernicus, if I remember right. Um, no, I'm just going to kind of move around. I don't remember exactly where this is. I think it's over here, yeah. And you see the craters kind of look very whitish with the light, the sun shining directly down. The Earth would be toward new phase. If you're standing on the moon looking up at it right now, mm -hmm. the the Earth would be very near, a uh, very thin crescent, new kind of phase. So okay, yeah. The moon phase, the Earth phase is always opposite to the moon phase, kind of when you look, on the, if you think of standing there on the surface looking back at the Earth. Okay, so I'm going to put the the reticle back on and center it where I believe I'm correct about this and please correct me if I'm wrong the right about there um, where the crosshair is and I'll try and keep it there 
as good as I, I think can. you're I think you're right I'm That's, looking at it's like the sea of tranquility yeah I, I, the only reason I remember this landing site is just because um, uh, two days ago I did an image of it and I looked it up because I wanted to mark it on my image so I remember that no. it's that round dot head animal head looking thing so, <laughs> um, so yeah, yeah it's kind of right on the edge of the bright and dark region there is the sea of tranquility where yeah. they landed so yeah so that's and there um, are there are three craters i think they're only about 10 kilometers across they probably can't see them in this view cannot but, see them uh, no. and they're but, named but, after the the guys yes yeah yeah collins armstrong and uh, aldrin all three got there's craters name right in that general region named after the astronauts so. right i remember seeing that on the map yeah so this is the apollo 11 landing site and then isn't there didn't i see um isn't there like a a, a moon base type of landing site or was that something else that, did they leave something down there i mean you can't see it obviously but they left the hardware the landing they left the the bottom stage of the limb Okay. Uh, the landing module is there, but okay. this is all. That's the biggest thing. It's all too small to see. With yeah, we won't be able to see any of it. Um, yeah. The flag, of course. Uh, everybody asks if you can see the flag, and of course that's too tiny. <laughs> and it probably got blown over from Apollo Eleven. Yeah. Uh, and it, it probably got UV. It's probably bleached white now from just UV exposure yeah. sitting in the sun. It, 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 we, and, we give uh, up. We surrender. Right. <laughs> they also left the uh, the Alsep the the surface experiment packages were mm. left there. Those are the seismic experiment and the retro reflectors and everything. Okay. All the missions left that. Those had a nuclear powered RTG. Interesting story. Um, What's an RTG? That was. It's a nuclear power. It's a radio thermal thermal isotope uh, generator. That's a new. Okay. It's powered with plutonium. Okay. It, to operate on the moon, uh, you're in darkness for two weeks at a time. So uh, solar power uh, doesn't really work that well. So you need something that will. Uh, do radioisotope decay and actually power these experiments. Apollo 13 had an RTG on it, uh, something they don't tell you in the movie, but they talk about an Earth to the Moon a little bit. They had a problem when they came back because Apollo 13 didn't land. The anniversary of Apollo 13 incident is this weekend, I believe. Um, they did not land, and the engineers had to figure out what to do with this nuclear RTG that they never planned to actually bring back to Earth that had plutonium in it, which is hazardous. So they plant ultimately when they ditched the Aquarius module that they used for a lifeboat, they purposely put it in the Marianas Trench and made sure it re-entered there. <laughs> wow. So the RTG is sitting at the bottom of the Marianas Trench and they did they did flyovers and seawater samples of the to make sure they've never get any kind of radioactive leakage okay. from it. Okay. But uh well, that's yeah, they is because NASA, which plans for every contingency and every plan, didn't ever think of what if we have to bring one of these RTGs back, what are we going to do with it? Yeah. So they, they they talk about it in Earth to the Moon is a really good documentary uh drama, docudrama series. Okay. But uh Apollo thirteen they don't mention it as much. But you know, I've been a, I've been thinking of, I've been reading a lot of uh, sci fi um, novels lately, which for whatever yeah. reason I don't, I don't it's just like my thing <laughs> at the moment. And um what, one thing they always talk about in the current novels that I'm reading is like, okay, we're going to eject this, you know, ship into a star. We're going to put this thing and yeah, put yeah. it on a trajectory into a star. Or like, you know, if they have a space battle, they, they launch the bodies as a <laughs> space burial, you know, into, a, into the star, right? Dispose of them, yeah. Yeah, basically it's like a safe way. To, we should, like, I'm, I'm surprised, like, I wonder if we'd ever be able to have the ability to, you know, aim something at the sun like that. You know, our star and be like, okay, cool. I suppose. You know? Because yeah. it's not, it's so it's, big that it's not like it would even... <laughs> <laughs> you know. That's what they did with the in the new series and with the Galactica at the end of Battlestar Galactica is they just put the fleet into the sun. So uh, okay. I suppose I don't even remember yeah. Yeah, the end of that. It's been a while since I've watched. Yeah, so. everybody was mad about the end of the series. <laughs> <laughs> Other than that, yeah. A... So I'm going to take this uh, crosshair off and I'm going to move it just so we can see a little bit more of. The, is it Mare? Do you say Mare Tranquilitas? I, I think Tranquilitas? Mare Tranquilitas would work. Yeah. Wait, how do you Steve, how do you pronounce Steve it? Mar, Mar, Mare, I think would work. Right, but the the tran tranquilitatis, what? Tran tranquilitatis. Okay. Yeah, astronomy has so many tongue tw twisting pronunciations. Yeah, they just. You know, like... a lot of constellations and stuff. With growing up, I never heard them said, like like Auriga and Ophiuchus yeah. and stuff like that. So yeah. then you realize, oh, I didn't, I was saying that wrong for like ever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, so where else? Let's see. Um, where was the one the one crater? Oh, there's a crater nearby that's actually pretty cool. Theophilus. 
Um, if I'm going the right direction, I think I am. Oops, it's right over. Let's see what it looks like with this view. Um, if I can find it. See, I've all, I'm always I've always said I'm yeah, the, not the, a moon the, guy. The coolest time to look at the moon is when it's actually at first quarter, because then you see everything kind of laid yeah. out in uh, yeah. in contrast. You see, things actually cast shadows, and the moon looks very like a real world, like three dimensional when you look down on it. Okay, uh, it's not Theophilus. I was thinking. Um, well, I was thinking of a different one, but this is. If I'm correct, this is Langrenus. Um, again, I not think sure, uh, I think you're right. I'm kind of looking. It's well, I'm cheating. Check this out. So I'm using a um, I'm using which which app is a Sky Safari. And oh, for 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 the craters. Yeah. So I'm using Sky Safari, and you can click. Oops, now, see, now it just went to compass mode. That's not what I wanted. <laughs> yeah, I'm very low-tech. I actually, I'm I'm looking at my little beat-up sky and telescope, like, reference. Oh, uh, see, now. that's hardcore. <laughs> that's hardcore. I mean, I, I started with all the star hopping and everything, but, yeah, now I'm, I'm too lazy for that. I can't be bothered anymore. Um, okay, so, yeah. So, with Sky Safari, so you can click on... Oh, see, it did it again. Anyway, you can click on... Um, well, the craters and the tells craters, you the craters, yeah, and that's it, cool. And it'll tell you exactly like, you know, where to go. So, so I, I use I use Stellarium in, in Starry Night mostly for planetary okay. programs, but yeah, I use Stellarium. Uh, Stellarium's cool because it's free. Yeah, no, this this Sky so far it wasn't bad. It was just a few bucks, and it was yep. it was worth it. So that's language. And uh, now I can learn. And I about use heaven, heavens above for satellite tracking. Okay, this one. Um, so I'm gonna put the crosshair on that one. Langrenus, where the crosshair is, um, and I'll take it off as soon as I see it. So yeah, that one, um, is 132 kilometers across. Um, so okay. it's actually, I mean, pretty big as far as a lot of these craters go. But one of the other cool things that I always look at, and I think, I don't know why it's just so cool, but, you know, you always think of the moon as being like this perfectly round, you know, thing, but yeah. it's, it's got mountains like everything else. And, you know, what we're going to see pop down. Um, and, and one thing they realized when they flew by and looked at the far side is we expected the far side to look just like the near side. There's not as many mare. It's mostly all craters on the far side. And there's still a lot mm. of discussion of why why that is as far as uh yeah the, the what exactly happened in the the presumably the moon formed from the earth like there was an ancient impact early in the history of the earth and they know this from looking at the material of the moon is very similar uh the elemental composition is similar to the crust of the earth the moon actually doesn't have much of a core per se compared to the earth so the moon is made up mostly of whatever hit the earth in uh, the earth's crust so okay okay it's, uh, and it's still receding away from us. Those Apollo experiments we we're talking about with the little laser ranging detectors, we know, mm -hmm. I believe it's six centimeters a year, um, just off the top of my head. I think that's the distance that the moon is slowly, they know from bouncing lasers off these things, off these retro reflectors, that they can tell that the yeah. moon is very slowly receding, which means we only happen to live in a time for total solar eclipses right now in about... I believe it's 600 million years. Again, I'm just I'm I'm spouting these numbers off without researching them. So, I believe it's 600 million years that the the last total solar eclipse will occur. Because the moon, oh, after okay. that, it's going to be far enough away that it won't completely cover the sun right. anymore. So, well, what I like to do just, is, if I don't know the numbers, I just say like, in a really long time from now, when all human <laughs> all humanity will probably be gone, there won't be any more <laughs> solar eclipses, right? Yeah. <laughs> But check well, I'm used to when, when you're teaching, you have to do a lot of talking on the fly. So you're yeah. like, oh, I don't have Wikipedia in front of me anymore to back this up. <laughs> exactly. But it's, uh, uh, do it. Some of the numbers I'm pretty firm on and other ones I have to. Yeah. Uh, and conversely, I think I calculated this as a billion years ago. The, the very first annular solar eclipse had to have occurred because the moon used to be much closer to us. Uh, the Earth being four point some odd billion years old. Okay. Um, 
the moon was once closer to us and you would never have an annular eclipse because the moon was visually bigger than the sun. So about, a, I think it was a billion years ago, I calculated, give or take. Somewhere back there, the very first annular eclipse occurred where the moon was finally far enough away that it didn't quite cover the sun and you had that ring of fire kind of look. So we, we live in that epoch right now where there, and even now annulars are actually slightly more common than totals. Yeah. Because a lot of people will say, well, isn't it a huge coincidence that we just happen to get total the solar eclipses? You know, isn't it too too big a coincidence to just be a coincidence? And I say, well, not really, because we live in that time frame right now where mm. it happens to be happening. And if you do a, I believe it's 60 to 40% annulars versus totals. If you look at the steady of 5,000 years of, in the current epoch, like in NASA's catalog, you look at the current epoch of total versus annular eclipses. Annulars are actually surprisingly a little more common, like 60 to 40%. Oh, wow. Okay. Than total solar eclipses. Yeah. So already total, already total solar eclipses are becoming a little less frequent okay. than than annulars. Yeah, so. the, I mean, yeah. So the farther it moves away, the less, the fewer of them we're going to have. Um, the one yeah, thing the I, more, I wanted the more to common talk about annular too, eclipses are going to be. So check out that top limb of the moon. You know, it's fully. You know, this is not the Terminator. This is not the, um, you know, the area where we would expect to see any, um, I don't know, any real ridge detail. But yet we see, you know, we can see the mountains. We can see the different. The different heights um, on yeah, the, yeah. on the edge of the moon, um, and if you guys saw something fly through the screen right there, that was a, we got a bird transit. So uh, <laughs> those are always cooler bats. Yeah, Sometimes exactly. Sometimes that make you get bat transit. I, it was either a bird transit or, or, or it was possibly an, like a, a bug on the inside mirror. Yeah, you never know what it is. Yeah, you get those too. Yeah, but you can see at the top here, it, it it's it's you know it's not this perfectly round marble. It's you know these things these these craters you know are kilometers deep and and these they're, they're mountains they're full-on mountains these things that we're seeing um are you are you near the sinus iridium kind of basin right there that the big it's kind of a big curved scarp uh because if you if you are that's where the chinese landed the u2 rover like the second one i believe i think it's just side? out of I think it's just out of frame. It looks like a big curved basin. It's really kind of prominent. I oh, think you're very close to no, it. No, I'm not actually. I'm pretty far away. It's on the oh, other okay. side. Uh, I got to find that. Um, if if it's what I think it is, is it like a partial, almost a partial crater? Yeah, it looks like a big curved yeah. crater. Kind like of. a bay. Okay. Um, that is. Yeah. Like that the Bay is, of Rainbows, I think is Sinus Arena. Yeah, yeah that's the name of it. no, that's down. Okay, I will go there, and so that's where the with all the Chinese news. That's where we'll take a look where they landed there. Did they crash that thing? I don't remember what happened. No, that was the rover, their first successful lander and rover okay. on the near side, and then I think that was 2016, 17, and then early last year they landed. They did the first landing on the far side. Um, Okay. See here. I, I know it when I see it. It's very prominent. Yeah, no, you'll see it just now when I come up on it because um, <clears throat> it's on the screen now. Uh, yeah, it looks like there's the lunar Eponese. Yeah, going the, back the highlands. That so, looks like. You know, it's almost there. Yeah, Mary right there. Yep, right there. Yeah, yeah that's it. So, that big curved basin. It was on the edge of that. Yeah, it's it's like a big landed. bay, they, they you know? Forever. You can just imagine. Yeah. It's like you can just imagine water, you know, <laughs> like these big. <laughs> Well, that's what they they kind of what they call mare. It's Italian for for oceans and seas, and they kind of to Galileo when they first looked at the moon, they, it, it kind of was reminiscent of them to yeah. that these look like flat water kind of basins. Um, it's ironic the moon seems so bright when it's full, but its albedo, its brightness, it's like well, it only reflects like ten percent of light. Uh, right. Yeah. It's not very at it, reflective it, at all. It's actually that's more like asphalt. That's like a reflect like worn asphalt has that kind of brightness. Yeah. Um, the astronauts likened it kind of moon dust to like coal dust, kind of. They said it actually yeah. the moon is actually kind of a dark object close up. So. So then it's, it's weird. It, it seems white. When it's then full, why is it so actually... reflective? Is it just because shiny surfaces, like you know, polished type of. Uh, it, well, it looks that that color. You're seeing it in contrast against the night sky, and you're seeing it all all that light condensed down. What light you're getting down to a kind of a point. I mean, the the full moon. It seems huge, but you can do the Tom Hanks Apollo 13 thing and put your thumb up and cover it, and you realize visually the moon's actually quite small. It is. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. Looking at it, up. just it, 
I, I forgot. It seems huge looking at it. But. Yeah, I forgot what the the um, what it's called, um, but it's that it's that effect that your brain. It's all in your head. It's all in your brain. You know, when when something is sitting next to it. So like, you know, I'm oh, sure. Oh, the, the 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 moon. It's 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 a variation of what they call the Ponzi illusion uh, uh, illusion or Ponzi illusion, where it's like you're seeing it against the the ground against some kind of foreground object and it seems larger. Yeah. Versus when you see it up overhead, but when you do when you you check it out photographically and you photograph it, you realize the moon's the same size on, on the horizon exactly, versus yeah. overhead. Yeah, and you can do the yeah. same thing with your thumb, you know, you just hold it like, like yeah. you just said, you hold it up, you can cover it up. And with the super moon and everything, one of the things that, that always bugs me is the, you know, what the media does with the, you know, they always talk about, and I know you and I are both kind of the media, but like, you know, what, what we, you more so than me, but like what we do, you know, we're always like, oh, the super moon, it's going to be amazing. It's going to be so big. It's like, not really. It's the same, you know, like to any, yeah, yeah. For, for you, all you can tell uh, visually if you could compare the, the smallest full moon of the year when it's mm. near apogee versus perigee, it, there's a little bit of difference, but it's, it's, it's nearly the same size yeah. every full moon. So yeah. Like you're not, you're not going to be able to look, you're not going to be able to look at it and be like, yep, it definitely is bigger. You know, like it's just, yeah, a, and, it's all in your head. It, you know? and, and the moon is actually closer when it's overhead by half an earth radii than when it's at the horizon it's actually half an earth it's a little tiny further away it's half an earth radii oh, away from, because from it's your not own. yeah because you have to like yeah yeah okay, because okay. you're viewing from the earth being, has to rotate into position that so when the moon's overhead it's actually a little closer not so much you would notice much of a difference yeah but, well yeah so now you now you're talking uh now you're talking geometry here so that's yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. well um I've been giving a few um, like astronomy related space universe um, keynote speeches here and there um, the last couple of years and one of the things that um, I talk about is trying to demonstrate the speed of light you know to people because like you can say the speed of light it's really fast it looks instantaneous all this stuff but it's really not like so one thing that we're looking at the moon right now through my telescope but by the time the light from the moon, not from the moon, that's bounced off, the reflected light from the moon hits my yeah. telescope, it's 1.3 seconds old. So we're actually yeah. seeing 1.3 seconds in the past, and we have no idea, you know, what it, what's happening at this current moment unless we were actually there, just because, yeah. because of the speed it, of light. So, it, it travels fast enough that when they were doing communications with the Apollo astronauts, you could tell the lag was perceptible. The yeah. Radio, because radio radio waves travel the same as the speed of light. So yeah, so it's like talking it to somebody one, over the internet, you know. <laughs> it was a little bit of a one, one or two, one and a half second lag. It was enough that they could tell the difference. So yeah, it's, definitely. Uh, I always like Douglas Adams' bit in Hitchhiker's Guide where he said light travels so fast it takes civilizations millions of years to discover that it travels at all. So, <laughs> It's like, it's I true. always thought that was a good way to explain it, it actually. Is. <laughs> it is. But the thing is, like, you can say that light travels really fast, but it doesn't, it still doesn't make sense. You know, like, it, no. to, to, to most people, to, I don't know, I don't know if our brains can really wrap it, ourselves around it, like, the fact that, oh, well, you know, well, how, how fast, you know, the moon is really far away, 1.3 seconds, what does that even mean? You know, it's, it's 300,000 kilometers away, you know, it takes... Actually, 380,000 kilometers, yep. depending. Yeah, so, I mean, it's far away. And, and if you remember last year in, in April, uh, I think it was April, when I took the, the photo of Saturn and the moon you yes. know, occulting. Yes, I remember that. Um, I, used, that really I, cool. used that, I used that photo as, as a, so imagine, so, you know, we're looking at the moon. I'm just going to move it around to give us a different view. But, you know, imagine Saturn, so the people watching now, we're, lo we're looking at the moon now. Now imagine seeing the planet Saturn hanging out right next to the limb of the moon, next to the edge. And you're seeing two things that are very different in time. Like, you're seeing the moon yeah. 1.3 seconds in the past, and you you're seeing Saturn 1.3 hours roughly in the past at the same time. So yeah. that always like blew my mind just to be like, we're basically looking at two separate points in time at the same time. If you want to. Well, in the case of stars, when they get occulted, you're looking at things uh, yeah, that are ugh, yeah. radically different ages. Thousands. But, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean. It was, it was a uh, Danish astronomer, old Romer. I remember researching this in the 17th century was looking at the moons of Jupiter and you know how they, they cast shadows and they go into Jupiter's shadows 
and they were making predictions of these things when they were occurring. And they noticed that different times, these predictions were always off by a, by a set amount, like 10 minutes, 15 minutes, where they'd say, oh, Ganymede's going to start casting its shadow. Mm. And they noticed these were always lagging, but he noted they were lagging in a very uh, predictable kind of way. And it was kind of one of those science moments where you're like, you know, instead of Eureka, he's kind of like, that's really odd. So he started looking into it, and he hypothesized that, that the light was taking time when Jupiter was at different positions from the Earth, and that was accounting for that lag in a few minutes that they were observing. This is in the 17th century. They're doing it by nothing but yeah. observation. And uh, so it's his prediction, his his measurement of the speed of light was about within 10% correct of the, oh, the current wow. accepted value. So that was... but. It's interesting because, like we were saying, the Douglas Adams quote: "People never really why should light take any time to travel because in everyday experience on Earth, it just seems that it is simultaneous. That light doesn't take travel time at all. So there was no reason for them to really think until they were looking at these sorts of events. And he had the kind of the forethought to to look outside of the box a little bit and say, well, uh, this is what's actually happening. And then they they realized that." And it was a big problem right up until Einstein to figure out light, the speed of light never seemed to vary. Even they were looking through what they, they presumed was called the ether, which was this material that was supposed to be there, figuring light must be transmitted. Sound waves need air, so light needs something to transmit it. So they're saying, well, if it's moving through the ether, if we look forward versus backward in the Earth's orbit, we should see light, you know, we should see it creating a drag or speeding up or it really confused them until Einstein came along and explained it. Uh, of why does light seem to travel at the same speed when you're looking at it from these perspectives, no matter what? Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm going to drink to that because I'm. <laughs> yeah, it, it gets more complicated from here when you get into relativity. So. Yeah, I keep I use um I, I bought uh, like a I don't know if it, maybe it was free at this point, but Einstein's theory of general relativity, the book. Um, and I used to use that on airplanes to help put me yeah. to sleep. <laughs> I mean, I could read it, and I'm like, okay, cool, this is good, but yo, it's dry. <laughs> well, see, yeah, I, I'm not a PhD astronomer, so it's like, and I still have to, when I'm writing, remember, I know, I know one is gravity and one deals with light. If you have mm. to break down relativity, they're special in general, but even then I still have to look up. Yeah. So I'm writing, so I don't say the wrong thing, and I get 100 comments, and it's like, well, you're talking about light, and it's actually gravity, and it's yeah. special versus general. It's like I, I, get the, I get the gist of what it predicts, Yeah. but when you get down yeah. into it, it is really arcane stuff. It's, it's, it's mind-blowing stuff. And they've tested yeah. it, too. That's the crazy part. So, like, all this, you know, speed of light and relativity and everything, it's just like it's, just, it's been tested now. So it's, it's right. You know? Yeah. It's crazy. Um, let's see here. Well, your GPS works because of relativity. If, if, if relativity was inaccurate, I know one upshot is, like, the, it needs to be accounted for in using a GPS for getting accurate yeah. positioning. But positioning wouldn't be correct. So that's some one daily application you can right. look at this that it has to take relativity into account yeah pe because, people yeah, people don't realize things that, would yeah. be meters off yeah. yeah because these things are you know these satellites the gps satellites are up there they are going they're they're traveling much faster you know they're traveling at speeds but they're also far away from the gravity well of earth and what else yeah. what else is the thing is this uh, just the distance in general i don't know you know and they, they and have like to said, account the, for light the, speed. yeah the 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 speed of light is perceptible over those kind of distances right. it, it's you know it's hundreds of milliseconds but it's still enough that that is perceptible yeah oh i was going to show um the, the famous the one of the most famous craters plato um just because it's it's so oh, yeah. it's so pretty um, I think it has a big filled-in basin, if I recall. It's not far from Sinus Iridium. Yeah, we were, we were just by it, and we were on it the whole time we were talking. But we, I think I saw it. I, I forgot to, to mention it. Um, yeah, no, it's it's in the in the middle of the screen now. So that is the crater Plato, and my focus just went a little bit to crap. But that's what happens. Let me see if I can fix it. Anyway, um, okay, so this is Plato oh, is. right in the middle. Yep. No, it is very, uh, zoom very in. prominent. So now it's it's zoomed in very big now. Um, but yeah, so some information about that particular one. It's uh, it's almost exactly 100 kilometers. It's 100, 101 
kilometers yeah, across. Yeah, it's so it's you know it's it's big, not as big as some of the other ones. I mean, we were looking at Langerness that was 132 um, kilometers across. Um, this one's 101. Um, it's interesting. It, it's got to be pretty old too to have a big filled-in basin like that too. It must yeah. be, yeah. I mean, I guess I don't know. Yeah. I don't know what else would call would cause that. I don't have any other information other than you know, other than that. But you know, that gives you a looking at it at this zoom level doesn't really give us any information but when we zoom back out to be able to see the limb of the moon and the edge you know we can imagine you know how actually large that oh, is. oh <clears throat> something i something i was just writing about the articles probably live on sky until has nothing to do with the moon but it's something to do with astronomy okay. coming up this week um yes the european space agency's bepi colombo mercury mission is doing an earth flyby friday so uh, there's a chance, actually, in South America, you might be able to catch it, too, as an eighth-magnitude star um, moving by. It's going to be about a third the distance of the geosynchronous satellites. This is a gravitational slingshot it's doing by the Earth to get to Mercury in okay. 2025. Okay. But uh, Heavens Above has a pretty good prediction page right now for observations of it. So I may try here in, in southeast U.S. Uh, about 1 in the morning or so. Uh, it, we may see it. Again, eighth magnitude means it's going to be... It's bright enough, maybe you could see it with binoculars, but not so bright you could see it with the naked eye. So okay. it's going to be like if you ever seen a satellite pass, it's just going to be a little moving star. But it's kind of unique to see a, a mission launched a couple of years ago on the way to Mercury flying by the Earth. So Yeah. This is a, another interesting spot. Oh, that's a nice one. And I forgot what the name of this one is, so I'm going to look at it. But it's it's super bright, and someone told me... And I need to look at this is Aristarchus, um, or Aristic. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Aristarchus. Aristarchus. Yeah, Aristarchus, Aristarchus, yeah something yeah. like that. Um, it's it's probably fun to listen to a struggle with these names, but, <laughs> but it's very very cool stuff. And you can look at my Twitter feed. Um, people watching, if you want to see one of the images, or look at my Instagram as well. Um, and there's a really cool image of it, and it shows it. There's like almost looks like a river coming straight from this this crater so i don't I, have no idea it must have been a big roll i down. think that's one where where observers have seen what they call transient lunar phenomena over the years observers have reported just bright patches or like flashes from different craters it's probably just reflections of of mm. like material that's like where the sun catches it just right but i I think this, the name of this crater reminds me of root. I think this is one of the ones that, that this type of phenomenon has been reported. So Okay, interesting. Well, I'm going to zoom in on it just because it's so cool. It's such a neat, neat crater, and it's difficult to get really good focus right now for whatever reason, but um, I'm trying here. And this is super zoomed. Let's see if I can tighten it up a little bit. Yeah, it's not not being very nice, but you can definitely see, you know, those those bright. That's a good zoom. Those bright areas, and it's yeah. just you know, it's it, it's just much more reflective. So like what it's it's the whatever material or mineral that that's you know rich in in that yeah. spot. Yeah, and it is it is one thing when the moon is full to see all these little like white patches and like the rays and crater rays and things like that is one thing. So yeah. generally, most even lunar observers tend to observe when the moon is toward crescent or first quarter phase we say quarter but it's half illuminated i know it's confusing in astronomy mm. it's one quarter of a lunation 29.5 days so okay just to be weird we, we call the the half illuminated moon the quarter moon. <laughs> uh, okay somebody came up with that convention way back when so i i, I know it, it always confuses people i say it's it's 50 illuminated quarter phase <laughs> first quarter phase and it's like so um, I just did some Googling on Aristarchus. Oh, and it looks like the focus is coming back a little bit, which is good. Let's see if I can keep it there. Um, so this particular crater is only 40, 40 kilometers wide, um, 25 miles for those people still stuck in the Stone Age and using um, yeah. imperial units. Um, but yeah, so it's only 40 kilometers wide, and 
let's see, what does it say? On Wikipedia, it says it's the it's considered the brightest of the large formations, and it's got an albedo of, of double the rest of the lunar surface, you know, on average, I guess. So, um, you know, that's why it's, yeah, it's just like, and even that, what did you say the, per, the, the albedo of the moon is? It's like around uh, 10%. It varies from the highlands. So it only reflects about 10% of the light that hits it. Yeah. Okay. So this this will do maybe 20%, <laughs> you know, ish. So I always liked this one. This one's such a cool feature. Um, but anyway. Okay, I was thinking, Aristarchus was the one that he made some rough calculations of the 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 Earth, Moon, and the Sun distance based on the fact that first quarter phase didn't occur when the moon was precisely 90 degrees okay. i'm moving my hands so but it's like <laughs> it's uh it's uh that he he made some actual some some pretty good um and it's interesting because these were kind of just thought experiments they did from just naked eye observations but mm. it, it was far enough off that he realized that there had to be uh the he could actually measure that long triangle between the earth sun and the moon yeah where there's a right triangle but it wasn't when a moon was precisely illuminated it was like when the moon instead of being 50 percent was like 49 percent illuminated and you realize that long 93 mile million mile i think he was off by quite a bit but it's interesting that in theory you could do that measurement it took them a while to actually get the one au measurement yeah um I think it was Hipparchus that did it during a lunar eclipse, the Earth-Moon distance, and he was pretty well, because Eratosthenes, another Greek, was the one in Cosmos they talk about that measured the circumference of the Earth and got pretty close to it. They knew from the Earth casting the shadow. See, the Greeks knew the Earth was round, because, I mean, it's an easy observation you do today. When you look at a lunar eclipse, you see the Earth casting its shadow. It's a round shadow. You can vis vis visibly see it on the limb of the Moon. So he realized that he could make a pretty good judgment knowing the size of the Earth and the angular size of the Earth's shadow out there at the moon's distance, how far the moon was. And he, the, the Greeks, they, it's, it's ironic, they, they hit on a lot of right things, and then the Dark Ages happened, and we had to figure all that stuff out <laughs> yeah. over again that they, they kind of had right to begin with. Uh, you know, periods in human history, what can we do, I guess? Yeah. I'm going to move us around a little bit. Um... See, that's an argument I, I have. I see come up in a lot of flat Earth discussions about. Um, I was like, well, you know, if you look at the shadow, is this is an observation you can make with your own eyes? If you want to go out and look, lunar eclipses are very common. A couple times, you know, every few years, you're, if you're on the right hemisphere, you'll see it. Is the Earth's shadow is round on the limb of the moon? Oh, when there you, you see go. It. Yeah, and it's round no matter. Uh, um, if it's on the horizon or if it's overhead or shadow is yeah. always round. So it's not a matter of, well, it's a flat plate casting a shadow. Mm. If it was a flat plate casting a shadow, then at moonrise and sunset, it would appear flat. Yeah. The shadow always appears round. So I need to look at this cause this is a really cool section too. And it's right on the edge. So we can't really see anything, but that, that dark, um, that dark patch, that crater, is Grimaldi. <laughs> Grimaldi, yeah, I see it. I see it, yeah. too. Yeah. Um, but I just, like, I mean, the crater's there. They're cool and everything. But I just love looking at the edge. And I love being able to see yeah. those edge mountain, the moons, or the mountains on the edge and the crater edges. And, I mean, I call them mountains, but they're just, may as well be yeah. mountains. They're huge. Uh, th that one is, and Grimaldi is, Grimaldi? Yeah, is big. It's 173 kilometers um, across. So that's a big one. These were all named by lunar cartographers, like, when they started observing the moon, like Galileo on and stuff. Ah, so that's Fran why they have mostly Francesco Greek names. Maria, uh, an Italian astronomer and physicist in the 1600s. That's where that name came from. Yeah, the name sounds familiar. Yeah. The name sounds really familiar. I assume it's... Now, the, Rus yeah. the Russians got to name most of the far side because they flew by and took the photos first. So, oh, like, there's okay. the, the Sea of Moscow and things like that <laughs> on the far side. So, okay. Yeah. And I've actually upped the... Um, the reason that there's so much um, contrast here is I've upped the, the gamma on this. So, it's actually... Oh, okay. Um, if I turn that off, I'll show you basically what it would look like without that. It's actually working pretty well on my phone, actually, just to watch Yeah, it. I think it looks a lot better with the gamma set. You can you can see those details quite a bit better. Um, so that's why I've got this. 
And if anybody has any questions, feel free to ask them uh, in the comments. Um, you know, do our best to answer them. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna tell you lies, and neither is Dave. If we don't know the answer, we're very fine saying we have no idea. Um, I've had a beer. Probably gonna grab another yeah. one just now. Um, we have nothing better to do, you know. We're stuck in our houses and stuff, so we're gonna look around again. Let's see what else we, have we got here. Oh, we were looking at this one. We'll go up and look at. Um, Yo, know, that's a big one. There it is, Gassendi. People like to talk about Gassendi lately. Gassendi, yeah. Um, it gets right up here, if I remember. It's not far from there the same is. area. There it is. Yeah, it's it's on screen now. Um, we'll be there for you, Dave, just now. But it's an interesting. It's right in the center. Um, it's kind of like a double, double crater. Um, but it's almost a ghost of a Those crater. Those are always cool. You know, it's like, it, it, it's not very deep, I don't think. Um, at least it doesn't look Yeah, there, there it is. It's kind of that, that half ring kind of right yeah. there in the center. Yeah, right. Yeah. And then it's got the one edge. So it looks like a, like a diamond ring or like somebody's, you know, engagement ring laying on its side. It's, that's 100, 111 kilometers wide. Um, let's look, yeah. let's, I'm going to look up some information so I'm not lying. Gassendi. Crater. It's on the edge of the the Mare Humorum. Yes, I saw that. Yes, the Mare Humorum. It's um, actually yeah. it is deep. Yeah, this I think this the is, sea of humors or something. This is the interesting stuff. It doesn't look deep at all. I mean, having that light, yeah. you know, straight up, you know, on that, um, it just flattens everything out. But that's almost two kilometers deep. So wow. <laughs> it's like it's 111 kilometers across and two yeah. kilometers deep. It's that's still deep. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's interesting. You look at the old artist depictions, what the moon's surface would look like, and they always had the jagged rock, create like like needle point mountains yeah. and things like that. And we realize that, that that really wasn't the case as far as what what they saw close up when they landed. Of course, they they landed in the safe places, yeah, but, um, because they didn't want to like crash when they first landed. But um, <laughs> the the moon isn't quite that dramatic. I guess you would figure there's no erosion other than more meteors hitting and things like that. But yeah. Still, uh, I'm gonna move us and back. We've only, Sorry, we've Dave. only landed on we've only landed on the near side of the moon, like human landings. Anyway, they, the, the Chinese landed uh, their U two three lander and rover on the far side last year, but that was the first and only far side landing. We've never landed on the far side of the moon. They did it for line of sight communications. It was just easier to uh, and safer for the Apollo astronauts to do their landings on the. And they've only landed in the equatorial regions. We've never landed. A, Bolts either so okay because they landed five times 11 12 13 didn't land 14 15 16 17 six times but. okay okay geez yeah so i'm someone asked um in the comments to see the uh moon landing site um and i'm going to find that again my bearings are terrible, so give me a moment while we look around at all these beautiful features. And kind of a, a semi-depressing factoid is uh, probably in the next decade or so, we're, we're losing most of the astronauts that have landed on the moon and walked on the moon. So you're talking about six landings, and there's two people per landing. That was 12. And there was another astronaut who um, died recently, a few weeks ago. Uh, Buzz Aldrin still with us. Um, buzz may never die, <laughs> but, uh, uh, we're probably in the next decade or so going to be entering an era. If we don't go back to the moon where no one living has walked on the moon, we'll probably be writing that story. Unfortunately, that yeah. since that there are now no living humans that have, that have set foot on the moon. So, okay. I'm going to, let's see, I've got it pretty much centered here. I'm going to get the crosshair up again. So right about there. George Mack um, asks, where is the moon landing? And right, oh, yeah. right where the crosshair is, is um, that's the Apollo 11. Let's see, I'm going to adjust it a little bit. There we go. That right, right about there is where the Apollo 11 landing happened. And it, um, you know, we're not going to be able to see. It's going to be right in the middle of the screen now. Obviously, as we, we discussed earlier, we're not going to be able to see any... Um, yeah. The uh, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter that is NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter is low enough orbiting and has a resolution. They've imaged the sites so you can see uh, 
the, the mission set had rovers, not 11, but you could see the tracks. You could see the base. The, the LEM base is like three meters across, about nine feet. You can see that still sitting there. So the, the okay. hardware they left there is still there. And you, okay. can, you can image it from the lunar reconnaissance. Can, can image it. Okay, okay. I'm going to give a view. Now, this is this is one of my favorite views. Um, let's see. Let me get this. I'll go for it. This is one of my favorite views. It's 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 a view basically from whatever side is on the top. So the the majority of the moon is going to be at the bottom. Um, yeah, yeah. But it, it's it's basically that that view that that you know the astronauts got when they were flying through on the in their lunar module. So it's just it gives you this 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 amazing flyby sensation. Um, that is cool. And you'll see it just about now on on the YouTube feed, but um, I mean it's on the YouTube feed now, but you'll see it. And it's yeah. just it's just one of those things that like it's just so beautiful. I I can't get enough of this particular view. So, see the phase of the moon moon did play uh, a role in planning for the landing, as they wanted to land near lunar sunrise when the moon is kind of like the shadow is along the Terminator because they wanted to have that contrast effect. So when they're landing, it was easier because they had to do, they had to kind of visually scout out yeah. where they were going to actually land. If you're landing during full moon, like the phase right now, everything looks kind of flat and non two dimension. It's hard yeah. to pick out boulders and craters. They deliberately picked like when they landed the sea of tranquility that the sun be rising just along that site mm. because that way that it's much easier for them to look out the window and say there's boulders there's uh you, you can listen in the whole uh, conversation when they're landing and you listen to the actual broadcast and uh there was a boulder field that neil armstrong kind of had to fly long past because they almost cracked the computer was aiming <laughs> to land there but he saw that that the field was strewn full of boulders when yeah. he got down low, so yeah, uh, that's the famous where he almost ran out of fuel before they landed. <laughs> but but they they deliberately picked that that phase of illumination so the astronauts could have the, the best visual reconnaissance when they were landing. So. Yeah, I, I love this view. This is just ugh, I, I can't get enough of this view. Um, that is cool, Dave. Do you have a copy of your book of the first book that you wrote? Handy. I do actually. Let awesome. Me get it. Awesome. I want you to show that on the screen. So while Dave's going to get that book, um, I'm actually going to let him talk about his book for a bit while we look at this nice view of the moon. And I'm going to go get another beer. Um, but a few of my images um, are in the book that he's going to show you. So like I said, if you guys have any questions, any, anything you want to see on the moon, we're going we're gonna to just kind of continue to tour around it. I mean, the super moon, it's a little bit bigger than the normal you know full moon but that's about it um it's it's just a pretty normal almost full moon and um yeah we just got a big telescope aimed at it right now and i can move it around whatever we want to do it's right behind me um this is the before you talk about the book dave i'm going to show yes so this is so this is the telescope we're using oh cool there's the camera there's the scope itself. It's right behind me. It's constantly tracking, um, you know, tracking the, the sky so I don't have to adjust it. I'm using a um, robotic focuser. It's this red thing right here so I don't have to focus um, from Prima Lucha Lab. And I'm using a, a nice solar system camera. And anyway, it's a big telescope and it's cool. So um, now, Dave, you've got your book. I'm going to let you talk about your book a little bit and I'm going to go get another beer. All right. Yes, my my first. Well, this is my second book. I did one at the universe today. That was a uh, guide to astronomy in 2017, but that was a free PDF. So, this was my first hardcover, hard copy book. Universe today's ultimate guide to viewing the cosmos, which even does have a chapter on planetary and, and, and lunar viewing, which has a moon map. We had to restrict ourselves to the top ten like things you can see on the moon. So we uh, otherwise. To view the moon would be an entire book onto its own. So we did one map, 10 different objects, like the top things you can see. And this book goes through astrophotography, deep sky astronomy, virtually everything I know about astronomy is in here. Solar observing, there's projects, there's how to build a sun gun, there's how to build solar filters, 
There's how to observe occultations we were talking about, and eclipses, and hang on, i got to plug my laptop in. We have a second book coming up that we're working on right now, coming out this summer, that is, I'll show you the my edited Backyard Astronomer's Deep Sky Field Guide that is going to be everything with star maps covering the entire higher sky, deep sky objects, the sky season by season. This is my hand done reference. Well, all the maps that I did, this is going to cover uh, deep sky, northern hemisphere, southern hemisphere, um, deep sky objects down to 10th magnitude. Again, we, we could go deeper than that, but we thought, well, 10th magnitude kind of gives you all the messier objects. It's essentially chapter four and five in this book is expanded into this book because again, to, to just do a brief rundown of the sky season by season and do all the deep sky objects and everything else, we kind of had to be really, even this one, we, we had to be, uh, for book number two, we had to be kind of uh, uh, a lot that edited out, but I'm kind of excited about it. So the idea with this one is to have a field guide that you can actually use at the telescope for star hopping. That's why I did the uh, white background with black stars and everything on it. So you can uh, go uh, region by region and zone by zone. And it was an interesting project. I kind of wish I had another book to write now because it would make the quarantine go by the much <laughs> Well, we'll try and do it's more like told of the wife, it's like, I was telling the wife, it's like, you know, it's, it's if I had a book, you know, uh, I probably wouldn't even know there's a quarantine out there right now because I would just be stuck in here writing anyway. So six months would go by. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> Let me look at, uh, let's see here. I'm going to move. I've started doing, I do some fiction too, and I've started with, with really? a little bit of extra time. I've started back into some, I've never really, I've mostly self-published with fiction. It's kind of a different uh, market to break into. But uh, I've just started going back through and doing some various uh, things with some story ideas I've had. So. Okay, I didn't realize you were writing fiction as well. <laughs> yeah. Fiction doesn't make me money, so I tend to write nonfiction and science, which makes a, a tiny bit of money. Um, so that's where I've kind of steered my efforts and energy toward. So. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Well, here's a pretty famous crater. I don't think we've talked about this one yet. If I'm, oops, why is everything? Okay, there we go. Uh, yeah, so this is Copernicus. Um, yeah, yeah, that's a super famous, famous one. one. Anyway, about your book, Dave. You know, congratulations on on that new one that you're going to be doing here soon. That's going to be cool. yes. That's what I was showing. The, yeah. it has a real cover, not this cover, but <laughs> this this is this is a hand edited. Uh, it's an interesting process. Until I had done a book book that uh, at the very last thing they send you is actually the printed. They mail to you the printed heart uh, book, and you go through and pen and ink all your final changes into it, and then you. Uh, well, I photocopied it, so I have my own copy, and then you mail it back to them, and and uh, it, it's a compromise. You know, the star charts aren't as big as I wanted, and, you know, we had the 200-page limit that you're kind of like, well, we've got the page count to make, so so not all the photos I wanted are in it, but it's, uh, I think we came up with something pretty cool. I think I will, I'll need to kickstart or something. If I want to do it, me and Fraser were talking about this, and, and it's fun to go through a publisher and it's good because, you know, you, you've got a publisher to back you and do all the nuts mm -hmm. and bolts of things. But there's also that compromise that goes back and forth, like I said, with the page count and the editing. And most of their editing choices are pretty good ideas, but they're sometimes they're like, well, do we need star maps? And I'm kind of like, oh, yeah, we need, <laughs> need star maps. It's kind of the point of the book. It's, <laughs> it's yeah, like, yeah. Know. No, that's cool though, and I don't know how many photos of mine made it into your book, but um, thanks for uh, you know ping, I, pinging me for those. I think there's half a dozen. Yeah, I've been I've been Ooh, going nice. through and doing that finalized count. <laughs> cool. I think cool. I think so. Yeah. Oh, I Again, that. I didn't get as many as I wanted, so oh, that's uh, cool. there was yeah. a lot of back and forth about that too. Ultimately, you know, and then when you're doing the editing of the template, there's the little gaps and places where you know this paragraph falls short. So okay, we can put an image there. There's a lot of that final shuffling that goes mm. on. Yeah. Okay, that's cool. Um, and what? I, yeah, so Dave and Fraser have been working together. Uh, Fraser Kane, we were talking about. I don't know how much you said about Fraser earlier, but 
uh, um, from Universe Today. They've been working together for a long time. And uh, 2012, I think, right around the Comet Ison oh, okay. era, back in the early week. Space, uh, so the virtual star party. you started working with him about the same time I befriended yes. him through the virtual star parties then. Okay. Yes, I, I started doing the virtual star party just before I started writing for him. Like okay. It was around that that Comet Ison, when Comet Ison was going to be the Comet of the Century. Yeah, that and, it, and it didn't, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was funny because I reminded him, it's like, remember I pitched you one time and you kind of just turned me down, you didn't know who I was? Is I... I I said, hey, there's this new comet, and we're looking at the orbit, and we think it's going to be a big comet. And it's like, oh, yeah, I remember that. No, it's that's like, funny. I pitched him at Universe today, and he turned <laughs> me down initially. So. Yeah, and, and now now you're like one of the main writers. <laughs> um, yeah. I got a no, comment he's, he's here. A good guy. He's built a good community. Yeah, he has, actually. There's a lot of good information yeah. on there, and his uh, YouTube channel I, is really cool, too. So, Just the community and the people I've met is really kind of cool. Mm. So, Yeah, it's funny. Like, I'm... Realizing now, I've been, I've been like you know, internet friends with all of those, you know, original guys with the telescopes and you and Fraser for, you know, eight years now. That's it's, it's gonna. We should have it's a ten year anniversary. A decade. Uh, yeah, it's it, it's yeah. not far from being a decade. He's been doing Universe Today since ninety nine, I think it was. Oh, yeah, last wow. year we hit twenty okay. years. I mean, he was doing it before there were blogs. Oh like, wow. The internet was okay. Was just a the internet was just a baby in ninety nine, if you recall. Okay. So, <laughs> wow. Um, so I'm going to actually move it back down to um, Aristarchus uh, because we had some information from a geologist uh, friend of mine. Um, is that right? Is, can you please tell me Nigel, um, Nigel Hicks? Um, he's a friend of mine in um, KwaZulu-Natal, uh, South Africa here. And uh, I, I believe he's a geologist, but I want to make sure he's not like something more, even more fancy than that. But um, he's oh, I see him in the comments. Yeah, he's telling me about... Uh, oops what what the the dark and light areas um of the moon they're actually you know what they are oh, there we go it's right there the aristarchus um let's get that in the middle more so aristarchus that super bright crater that we were talking about earlier um nigel says uh the light areas of the moon are, are most likely made of a rock type called a anorthosite which is an igneous rock um and the lighter colors come from the mineral, whoa, plagioclase? <laughs> plagioclase, I think, yeah. <laughs> That's what I'll call it. Yeah. Um, he said it's very clean cleavage breaks so that um, it likely it's like sharp reflections. Uh, and he says the darker areas in the moon, he's a doctor of geology, he says. Nice. Um, so he said the dark, darker areas are basalt, uh, which is not very different from the lighter zones um so that, which is why i suppose it all kind of looks similar in reflectivity in the in the libido yeah. or the, the albedo um let's see what else does he say <laughs> oh interesting okay yeah talking about the decon traps in india yeah, yeah. I've, I've i don't even know what those that. are i don't know i'm not sure what those are basalts include decon traps in india and the oh and the drakensberg here in south africa the drakensberg mountains um very cool area one of my favorite areas of what oh, we're losing i know that decon traps come up when they talk about earth's climate like the some of the dramatic uh, climate change events that had happened early on okay. I, I remember coming across that term before Okay. Like it's a big volcanic uh, <coughs> event. Okay. I'm wondering maybe we should uh, maybe I should get yeah. Nigel. Geology has it. I should get Nigel in here to to, to, to to talk about <laughs> all the geology of the moon when we look around. Maybe we'll, yeah. we'll schedule that in sometime. That's cool. We've got someone from from Italy with us. Yeah, yeah that's cool. I see that? Uh, I actually got the comment stream going. Oh, cool. Yeah, there you go. So. We've got that now. Okay, so let's go back to. Thanks, Nigel, for that information. Um, check is in the mail, <laughs> and um, we both know the South African mail service, so you might never get that check. Just saying. <clears throat> Where is? We were looking at not Tycho, because that's Tycho that I'm going to now. Um, I need to find it. We were we were looking at Copernicus. It's the and over on the other side. That's Tycho. Yeah, 
Copernicus, one of the most prominent craters. Yeah, it's like... It kind of sits off by itself, too, so... Yeah. But it's got those was... nice... I was saying, in, in my last yeah. book, we had a moon map. We, we could only do the very best objects because we were kind of constrained by... We could only have one half-page moon map in here, but there is a section where you have the... The Lunar X and the Apollo landing site and Kepler and Copernicus and some of the, the, the top objects is what we did, basically. Okay. In the new book, we're doing that, too. We're doing deep sky objects, but we're doing... My rule was down to 10th magnitude, mostly, so covered all the messier objects, uh, some of the brighter NGCs. Okay. Um, when he says um, messier objects, the, uh, messier objects, the he's, brighter double he's talking stars. about um, Charles Messier, who is a very famous old, you know, astrophysicist back then. What did they have? Just astronomer. Uh, Just astronomer. <laughs> yeah, and uh, so there's um, how many how many messier objects are there? One oh nine, I think. One hundred nine. Uh, no, no, there's one hundred and ten at I, least. I think there. So, there's one hundred and ten. That's right. There's one hundred and ten. Yeah. Yeah. The the catalog, I think, and some of them are errors. Like I know uh, Messier forty is there's some spurious objects in the catalog. So okay. And there were there were different iterations of the Messier mm. catalog. There was some other. Cause he didn't write it all at once, but yeah. yeah and I, think, so, and so, I think it may be at least in the astronomy. One hundred and ten range. Yeah, in the astronomy field, if you want to call it, uh, for me, I'm not a I'm not a professional astronomer or anything. I'm just an uh, enthusiast amateur. But um, the Messier objects are they're bri the brightest targets in the usually in the northern hemisphere um, sky. Uh, basically, they're, they're just it's a good list of things to look for. You can use, um, yeah. you know, like in Dave's book, uh, the the backyard. What's it called again? I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm oh, terrible. the the newer one is uh, the backyard astronomers field guide to the there we sky. go yeah so yeah. it'll it'll talk about yeah. the Messier yeah. objects in there and the just old one has targets. a brief rundown of some of the deep sky objects okay. but the newer one kind of expands on that chapter a little bit and uh, Charles Messier didn't really know what he was looking at he just knew he saw these fuzzy he was hunting for comets actually so he kept yeah. seeing these fuzzy patches that he would keep coming across like the Crab Nebula mm. and. Uh, M13 and the Ring Nebula and Lyra and stuff, and so he figured he would just make a compendium of these are not comets, but these are fuzzy patches. In yeah, the it's sky. like so the messy objects are, are his failures, right? It's <laughs> yeah, so he just started a basic. Well, I think he was using a, I think it was like a three or four inch refractor, and of course it suffered from chromatic aberration, you know, which most of the older refractors did, and it wasn't by today's standard, it wasn't a great optical instrument at all, but that was the state of the technology at the time. Yeah, so. yeah definitely. Um, and that, that's why he really did because, you know, his telescope just wouldn't go that thing. So, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, it's a, and he was also constrained by his location. Uh, I think the, the, the most southerly object is Messier 30 or Messier 2. Uh, it doesn't go down beyond, so he missed all of the large Magellanic, the cloud, the Tarantula Nebula, and all that Southern Hemisphere stuff. He couldn't see it from his European yeah. location. So, all so the, the Messier catalog doesn't extend down that far. Yeah, all the good stuff. Yeah, down here. But yeah, the... yeah you, you guys got all the all the good objects down oh, there. Oh no, so. you know what? Yeah, we're miss in the Southern Hemisphere down here. We're missing most of the good galaxies. So you know. Yeah, that, that's the one thing we have up here. Is, yeah. Is, is, uh, is M31 and some of the better galaxies. Yeah. But I've been down, I've never been to South Africa. I've been to Australia, New Zealand, um, Ecuador, Peru. I've been to Kenya in Africa, it's as far south as I, but, but we were south of the equator there. So okay. I've, I've been south viewing a few times. So New Zealand was probably the furthest I've been down south. But. Okay. Yeah, I know it's beautiful skies down here. Um, yeah. So this crater we're looking at now is one of the, one of the most more famous, most famous, Copernicus crater. Um, it, it's interesting, and most of these famous craters are usually around the same size. So this is, again, almost 100 kilometers across. It's 96 um, kilometers across. It was, uh, it was named um, by, after, by. It was named by a Polish astronomer um, in, yeah. well, 14, in the 1400s and maybe the early 1500s. Um, so yeah, Copernicus existed in the pre-telescopic era. So yeah, yeah. So he he, he got he was it was named posthumously. He yeah. was around fifteen hundred. Yeah. So interesting. But the, but the tele Galileo didn't start using his telescope till sixteen ten. Didn't invent the telescope, but he started. He he observed 
the heavens with it and he published and wrote about what he saw is what really kind okay. of made his reports stick because there is evidence that there were astronomers that even had done some observations before galileo so it's it's uh, the most correct way to say it is he he, he published as what he saw in observations so okay okay yeah and I'm, I'm looking at wikipedia here and um it's this is a deep one copernicus is quite deep but well to me it's the deeper one that we've seen tonight um is uh 3800 meters so 3.8 kilometers deep um pretty deep it does it it uh, on another night we'll look at it again and you know it will be much more prominent and you'll be able to tell it looks um, very different when the moon's full when yeah. it's when it's kind of off to the side you get a little more shadow and contrast yeah. so um and it, it's the cool thing you can see those what looks like you know the cracks coming out from what yeah. look, you know it looks like a crack you know from the meteor and it looks like those are called rays um and basically just those are just impact you know things ejecta i don't i don't know what a, a good a good you know easy term to use is just like all the stuff that just got blown yeah. out of that when, when the when the meteor hit the moon and it just got all blown off to the side and those are literally like trails from all of that stuff um yeah, and, yeah i think copernicus is pretty young as well oh yeah what does it say actually it doesn't um, does it give an age for it uh let me look at wikipedia a little more. i'm gonna guess a few hundred million and see if i'm right <laughs> Where's age? Can we look at age? No, I need see. I need somebody like watching. Somebody out there, beat me to this, please. So otherwise, you're gonna be waiting a moment. They they can they can estimate these by by the placement. Like you know, if there's other uh, craters that have impacted over it, you know, it's kind of like a lot of things in geology. It's just how things are placed in different layers. Um, yeah. Obviously the things over the top of one layer have to be newer than the other. So you saw a crater with a lot of impact craters over the top of it. Um, they can place a rough estimate on how old, knowing they know the rough rate that craters are being formed. Oh, you, you know, ready? Oh, wait, wait. Rate. Um, ah, what did I see? The results are inconclusive, but not inconsistent with the estimated 800 million year age. 800 million years crater for pretty old though it's just on the high yeah. closer toward a billion years so yeah i'm just reading off wikipedia so you know whatever it's if i'm if i'm wrong then wikipedia is wrong so. <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, <That never happens. laughs> so, anna says cool yeah it is cool the moon yeah. is cool i don't know which part she was saying is cool but i think it's all pretty cool so that's, that's... is it pretty cold down there right now because you're you're all going toward winter, um, right? Not too bad. I mean, I'm outside. I yeah. keep taking my hood off and putting it back on because okay. I'm getting warm-ish. But no, it's not too bad. It was, I think today it was around, I mean, it was a nice sunny day. It was mid-20s or, or yeah. you know, lower 20s today, Celsius. Um, and, yeah, no, at night I have to look, but it's not too bad. Not too but you're bad. not too far south latitude-wise, so, mm. yeah. We're at 27 degrees. So okay, yeah, it stays, so it's not, it stays it, it pretty prob warm. It, it probably doesn't vary as much. Yeah, no, so no, no. Seasonal-wise. Yeah, we get about a 20-degree 20, 20 shift from winter to summer. You know, that's about it. Okay. Not, not even. I mean, 15, maybe. Yeah. So it's... Yeah, here we're, we're, we're spring going towards summer, so it's already starting to get... We have some cool mornings still, but it's getting warmer. Okay. So it's too bad this is whenever when you want to be outside in the spring, so it's... A, and difficult to be inside right now. Yeah. What, what do we... Uh, throw out some craters that we haven't looked at that are pretty cool. Um, uh, let see. We did Copernicus. Um, Eratosthenes isn't far away. Where's that one? Uh, should be, like, up about the 2 o'clock position. Well, of course, you're, you're upside down, so it would be maybe, like... Is it small? Seven, the... It's like right near the, the lunar Apennines, which is that long chain of mountains oh, that's yes. uh, not far from Copernicus. And lunar Apennines are kind of cool, you. too, though. I got you. I know where I'm at now. Okay, cool. Um, kind of right off the tip of them. Yep. Oop, other way. Go here. Should be... Wait. No, I'm messed up now. See, this is great. Yeah, no, it should be there somewhere. 
Where are you? I think there's a lag between. Okay, now I see it moving. Yeah, there's a there's a lag between us talking on Zoom and me watching over on on your feed. <laughs> uh, for some reason, it almost looks like Eratosthenes is. Is it too small to get a good image of? I don't. You know, yeah, it looks like it's too. It's a little small to get a good image of it. Um, right Weird. Now. Which seems. I mean, I see it, but not really. Did it disappear? Did Eratosthenes disappear? Sometimes some features, when the moon's toward full, they're not as prominent. Yeah, it looks like you're right along the lunar. Yeah, I mean, I see where it right should along be. The lunar Apennines, right there. Yeah. That that long sweep of bright mountains. That's the lunar Apennines, right there. Yeah, no, I see, that's where it should be, and I see the dark spot of its of the shadow, um, where it would have a shadow right now, and it's just very, very, very flat. It's interesting, yeah, sometimes when, when the, the lights cast straight down, some prominent features are almost, like, not visible, but... Okay, And so... there's always, like, the but a long first quarter moon that look like, see, the lunar X is always kind of a nifty thing, but that's, you're not going to see it when it's yeah. full... We'll look at another one here. Let's look at some other ones nearby. Um, I wonder if we'll be able to see... Okay, so, like, we can see these little spots. You know, these little... Um, so, next to Plato, we didn't really talk about um, these spots that are kind of... S these these little mountains next to Plato. Um, the the Montes Tenerife... Um, are right in the middle of the screen now and those they're just mountain range on the moon um, just a small 112 kilometer mountain range I'm gonna put the which Plato again yeah so it's right to the right of Plato there um, and the, the crosshair is on them and it's just a little mountain range on the moon it's a hundred and a little it's 112 kilometers across um, yeah named from the island Tenerife. So, is it Tenerife or Tenerife? I'm not sure. <clears throat> I think it's Tenerife, okay. I think. So, yeah. Oh, and, and Nigel, the geologist, is um, he's throwing all kinds of good nuggets of wisdom on the on the comments. If you make sure you read those. Um, um, yeah, he says, he says, so that crater, we talked about the crater that was um, 3.8 kilometers deep. Um, yeah. So, so the, the highest the highest mountain in, in the Rockies is 4,500 4, meters. So it's only one, you know, it's one kilometer less than, you know, the highest mountain in the Rockies. So if you think about that, it's pretty deep, you know. That is pretty deep. Um, oh, another crazy fact. He says the largest crater on Earth is here in South Africa. Um, oh, at a place called Frieda Fort, um, which formed two billion years ago, which is 300 kilometers in diameter. So the largest kilometer on Earth is about three times the size of most of the craters that we've been talking about um, yeah. tonight so far. <clears throat> I didn't realize until recently in research that the Chesapeake Bay area here in Virginia was a major, there's not really, uh, erosion has covered it, but uh, 70, I think it was six like 20, 30 million years ago, I could be wrong, there was a major impact in this area that they, they know it from just like the geological record, but it's a, I, I had no idea. Okay. There's, it's, yeah, I think it's like these things are so old, they just get eroded and, and, and we just lose them, you know, over time. Wow, that yeah. was fast. I didn't mean to do that. <clears throat> I wanted to, to check out these um, this mountain range. Um, that you were mentioning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of oh, the Lunar Apennines. Yeah, the Lunar Apennines. Looking at that now. They look very prominent toward first quarter, too, but you can still kind of see the sweep of the mountains there. Yeah. Yeah. Montes Apennines. Okay, cool. Let's, let's check out any. Yeah, it just says mountains. 600 kilometers wide um, or across, so they're relatively wide. Um. I'm curious. I'm going to do a... There was one of the Apollo missions, I think it was 17. I think the Fromoro Highlands are very near there. Um, 
I'd have to look all this up, but I think one of the Apollo missions landed very near there. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so this, what we're seeing here is um, the lunar Apennines, the Montes Apennisus. Um, they're just a rugged mountain range. <laughs> they're named, hey, and this is interesting um, for the Italians watching right now. These are they're named after the Apennine. There's the European range, yeah. Yeah, the Apennine Mountains in Italy. Their formation dating back about 4 billion years, 3.9 billion years give or take, you know, 100 million. Um, <clears throat> they're technically, you know, still relatively young at 3.9 billion years. So, yeah. uh, they are 5,400 meters, so 5.4 kilometers um, in elevation. That's 17.7, 17,000 feet um, yeah. high. And, yeah, I mean, it's just these beautiful mountain range that we can see again we'll look at that more on another another time it looks similar to this just with a lot more detail you see a lot of shadows and things with these so yeah it's very very cool. yeah like I said first quarter moon is always a good time to look at these yeah let's see what else do we got if anybody wants to see anything let us know otherwise we're just going to kind of move around I'm going to go up to the <laughs> There side. is on the on the limb of the moon um, down toward I think it's the o Oceanus Pro Procellarum. There is a seventy mil a kilometer wide lunar swirl. I don't know if this would be a something we could see. Lunar swirl. What is yeah, a lunar yeah, yeah. swirl? It, it, it's called Rainier Gamma. Okay. It's one of the most visible lunar swirls. Lunar swirl is. Let me actually look at Wikipedia. Enigmatic features. Oh, hang on. Found across moon surface, characterized by having a high albedo, appearing optic optically immature, having optical characteristics of relatively young regolith, and also having a sinu sinuous shape. Well, I'm all about being immature. Cheers to that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see here if I if I can uh, see where you're aimed. I need to find it then, because this is interesting stuff. Yeah, I think I've written about it before. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna Google a learner swirl. Okay, what does he say? Oh, okay, it's, yeah. The nearest big feature is that is it's along on the edge of the moon near uh, Oceanus Procellarum is that large Maria. I think you're at the highlands now. Yeah, keep going. Da uh, going down. Okay, I'll go down some more. Let's kind of go along the edge here and see if we can okay. match up. Uh, let's see. I think that double snowman crater you were talking about before is close. It's on the edge of the moon. Okay. I don't know if this may be too small. I think you're getting closer. See a lot of stuff in the atmosphere right now. Is it right along the limb? Yeah, it should be. Rainier Gamma. Rainier Gamma. Okay, I'm going to Google it and see if I can find. <clears throat> it's not far from the Kepler crater, or uh, Kepler. Oh, it's not far from Kepler. Kepler. Okay. Yeah. Which kind of was? along that same dark area, that, but closer off to the edge. Yeah, where's Kepler? That's, that was not, that's Capra, Cassatus. I'm going through, all my, I don't remember where Kepler was, I forgot now. No, there's one named after Zucchini, I like it. And, <laughs> um, where in the heck was Kepler? If you want some information, go check out the comments. Nigel is going to town over there. Um, see if I can get. You said it's near the edge. I'm trying to find it now. <clears throat> okay, I'm gonna look. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna give up, and I'm gonna look at Wikipedia for the Kepler crater. Kepler lunar crater. 
I need a I need a zoomed out photo here to tell me. Oceanic Procellarum. Yeah. I love this edge of the moon. I just love looking at the edge there. It's so cool. Oh, that's the Oceanus Procellarum. Okay. It's actually, we're, we're somewhere in that area now. If I can just yeah, I think and... you're close. Hey, there's a there's a crater called Fourier. Fourier. Do some oh, interesting. Yeah, I've never heard of that do one. Do some transforms. Oh, there's Rainier. This is what it looks like. And there's Kepler. Okay, so you say it's near Kepler. Well, it's nearish in that same region, that same quadrant, kind okay. of. But it's closer off to the limb. This is everybody who's watching. This is how exciting astronomy can be. <laughs> Are you guys freaking out or what? Yeah. <laughs> it's all trying to translate what you see on the page to the eyepiece to like actual movement yeah sometimes it, it can be a little yeah we don't really know um, what we're doing half the time this is amateur astronomy yeah. i should i should say professional astronomers know way better well you know though a lot of professional astronomers come to it via uh, theoretical physics so observationally they're they're not as uh, and most of them they're plugging in things to a computer so when i used to work at the flandreau observatory in tucson that was near the lunar planetary sciences lab there were people working on the Mars rover that had never seen Mars. They would come over to the observatory and say, "Oh, I just I want to see Mars because I've never actually seen it." So, oh, wow. I mean, you know, so it's uh, you you can be very finely specialized in your field as far and and not really uh, uh, get into astronomy without knowing a lot of the obser observational astronomy. Okay, what'd you say about Rainier? There's a crater called Reiner. Reiner Gamma is the name of this. I I think that looks like Kepler right there. Yeah, that it? was Kepler. I'm moving down because Reiner is down below it, near the edge. It's. Let me turn my my brightness up here a bit. It's going to be just about there. You'll see it. Reiner Gamma. Okay, is right below. Yeah, Reiner Gamma is like there's that spot that's kind of in the middle. I'll put it in the cross here. Okay, so that is Reiner Gamma that the crosshair is on that you'll see in just a second. It's that lighter spot. Okay, so I think we are seeing it, but it doesn't look as, as prominent as a swirl. I think we are seeing it there kind of as a tadpole-shaped yeah. area against that dark area. Okay, but this is in. actually what, what they say it's, it's uh, one of the better... Yeah, yeah, you get the crosshairs right on it. Good. Um, one of the better examples of a lunar swirl, which is kind of an enigmatic object, something it's not the usual craters or or uh, different features you see on the moon. So mm, I just zoomed in on this thing. And it says the origin of lunar swirls not completely understood is associated with localized magnetic field, but not any, with any particular irregularities in the surface. Similar features were discovered in the Mare uh in in genie i'm gonna totally butcher that uh by orbiting spacecraft the feature is located lunar point opposite the mirror embryum other likewise one hypothesis is that the feature resulted from seismic energies generated by impacts that followed these mara maria however no such lunar formation is on the opposite side of the moon from this one so yeah, it's it's interesting. So yeah, we are proper nerds here right now. This is good. Oh, you got it zoomed in. Yeah, that's kind of cool. And I I just messed with the focus a little bit, so you can try and maybe the atmosphere will chill out a bit and give us a, a chance to look at it better. And I'm trying. And there are other things like the lunar straight wall, but it's probably not a good time to look at that right no, now. No, the straight wall is pretty boring right now. I tried to find it yeah. the other day. Uh, yeah, when the when the sun's rising on it, it looks quite dramatic. Yeah, it's beautiful. Um, where is it even? I forgot where that was. This is how bad. I know what it looks like when I see a photo. It is. Yeah, I know when I see it, then like it pops right out. 
when, when it's illuminated just right it pops right out now the focus is coming in a little bit better on this um Rainer Gamma. Okay, yeah, it kind of looks actually like like it's Wikipedia a little bit now. It's not something looking across the moon that it's like a lot of things in astronomy. It wouldn't jump out at us, but just mm. to know kind of something about what it is makes it kind of cool. Yeah, the fact that we don't really know what the heck it is is even better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like you know I've I've shown Pluto to people because they wanted to see Pluto, and I'd be like, uh, you're you're going to be underwhelmed because it looked like a little dot. Yeah, but it's just horrible. Knowing. Yeah. Just knowing what it is is kind of nifty. Yeah. Or seeing a quasar, for example. We've hunted down quasars, too. And it's, again, it's like, prepare to be underwhelmed because it's going to be a really faint star. But just to know that you're seeing that that light is billions of years old, to yeah. for Carl's sake. So. I remember um, when Vesta, um, I think it was, was it Vesta was closed last year? Was it Vesta? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, asteroid. Yeah, it sounds right. Yeah. Um, I remember I, I took a photo from inside my house out looking out the window, and I could see um, Vesta in the photo, and I could see it in, the, in my binoculars as well. And I remember thinking, like, how cool it was that I was seeing. It wasn't a star. It wasn't something that was emitting light. It yeah. was actually, you know, a, a space rock that was, was it past Mars orbit? I think it was. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was. So it's yeah. past Mars orbit, long further away than Mars, and, and and smaller, much smaller, and I could see it as if it were, you know, I mean, and this thing yeah, was yeah. just like this random space rock, and it was so cool to be able to see that. Like it was just a dot. Like who cares, right? It didn't even look like anything. Yeah. But it was just the idea of what yeah, you're seeing. Yeah, since a lot of things in astronomy, just knowing something about what you're seeing it makes it a little more amazing. Sometimes it just looks like yeah. nothing really otherwise that you would you wouldn't notice it just scanning around uh, casually. But it's a and if you follow asteroids, they move like a little bit every night, so you just follow it. Yeah. That's how they were first discovered. So exactly. But yeah. And Vista, we didn't have images of it till Dawn spacecraft flew by. Um, 2011 2012 we most of these asteroids we still have no knowledge what amazes me is it's a uh, i forget the name of this instrument but it's on one of the european southern observatories telescopes they can actually do some pretty good images of asteroids uh they they did some images of vista with this ground-based telescope using adaptive optics and all the different types of like instruments they have now and it's pretty darn, not quite as good as the Dawn spacecraft, but you can make up some of the same features. So it's amazing to me that uh, ground imaging is getting that good now that they can get some pretty blurry, good blurry images of asteroids now. Yeah, pretty, well, it's crazy. Amazing. Yeah. Well, we've how many how many comets have we landed on, or asteroids have we landed on now? Two. Uh, well, there's Bennu. Um, there's uh, what's the other mission? There's. Uh, there's Hayabusa 2, that's the Japanese mission. The Japanese have done two. They did Itikawa, they've done Bennu. Uh, we have the one uh, Osiris-Rex right now that's going mm. on. Actually, that's Bennu. That's mm. Osiris-Rex is at Bennu. Okay. Um, Hayabusa 2 is at Ryugu 2, I believe it is. Okay. So some of the stuff I've actually written about, so it's in front of my brain. I don't know. All um, of these names just sound like from they're from Street Fighter, so I'm pretty sure we should <laughs> play some, some old school 8-bit video games right now. That's what I want to do. On this crater that we're looking at right here, um, it's in the middle. It should yeah. be in the middle for you. Yeah, it is. Um, this thing, it's every time I look at it, it, it kind of freaks me out. It, it's like it's like a squid. It looks like a squid. Oh, yeah. I don't know what crater that is. It's Schiller. Schiller, okay. Yeah, um, and... and and the only reason I know is because I'm, I'm, you know, cheating and looking. It's yeah. Um, it's usually impact related, but maybe volcanic in origin. Um, it's 179 kilometers across, but it's kind of shaped strangely. So, it makes me wonder if just because like we're looking at it at that angle, if it's, you know, maybe a couple of different oh, craters. I see it on my map too. It's got some it's, of the ones toward toward the polar region. We know in some of these shadowed polar regions, there there is uh, water mixed in with the regular. So. That's kind of where they want to go and land next and explore. Okay. Um, maybe send some rovers down those areas. These are from comets that have hit, but the water's never sublimated because they're in permanently shadowed areas down there. So. Okay. That's uh. Acor and we've never landed this, in the holes. So. Yeah, according to according to what I'm reading now on this, it says it was it was um, it was named or discovered or whatever by an un, an unknown 
or it was a, by somebody Julius, uh, a German astronomer in 1627. Okay. Um, there's a really cool image of the lunar orbiter uh, image of this thing, and it is very irregularly shaped. So it's not just the angle; um, it's actually yeah. it's actually shaped very strangely. Um, you know, like an ice cream cone or a squid or something like that. I don't know. Um, so, what are they? What are they saying? It's yeah. It's elongated. Um, it's yeah. I'm reading some information on Wikipedia now. Oh, this is interesting to note. Um, most of the yeah. crater floor is flat, most likely due to lava flooding. Oh, interesting. So basically, it was. I'm guessing it's old then. Let's look and see if it's old. Remember, as a kid, like in the 60s and 70s, hearing there was still a discussion out there whether craters were volcanic or due to impact. Yeah, you know that was uh, it, most of them now are we we know were due to impact, but there was still that controversy that far back, like pre Apollo, that um, that there was one camp that thought craters were mostly volcanic, another camp thought they were all due to impact. So okay, I wonder if, if if Nigel's still watching, maybe he'll chime in with some information about that. <laughs> Mike Petanella says that's cheese. It is cheese. Yeah. We should just do like moon, moon beer and dad jokes. That's what we should do sometimes. <laughs> we're gonna do that. They're like, yeah. everybody pull out your your worst dad jokes, and we're gonna we're gonna do these. Um, I don't know. Just probably yeah, the, it's probably just, the top of the hour here. I'm probably going to disengage. But okay, cool. Yeah, um, that's about now. So I mean, we've pretty much looked at well, a few more minutes, but cool stuff. I'm gonna actually do. I'm gonna take. So I'm gonna do an imaging run of this uh, real quick because I'm. Yeah. I, I, I dig this. I may run. do some imaging when it rises tonight. Just some some landscape with the moon rising. Yeah, do it. My, do it. I, got, I go up to the. Uh, uh, I I still have kind of a site here at the park and garage roof, even though we're we're locked down. That I can kind of just go up there and get a pretty good view over the city skyline and do some photography. So you're in a flat. You, that's right. You're in a flat. yeah. We're we're in a we're in an apartment in downtown Norfolk. We're just in a uh, we're in a studio apartment, kind of. So so what's uh, okay? So what's that like? Is it horrible? I mean, so like I'm in a, I'm in a house and I've got a garden. I've got a, a a small grass yard, you know, that I can hang out in and whatever. Yeah. And like, it's not too bad because we we already work at home. It's just me and the wife. Okay. Uh, we have a porch uh, that we can go out on. Uh, you can still go out and walk around. Uh, you just uh, everything is closed except the grocery stores and, and things like that. So okay. okay. Oh, is he observing? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I'm gonna cool. Do, yeah, run. Do a little bit. Of... Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I always like to talk about so like people, people that. Well, you know, one thing we're not we're going to be talking about in a month or two is like is like I I, I needed a haircut when we started this whole thing and now that we're locked down. Mm. Uh, <laughs> we're all, we're all gonna be we're all gonna have ponytails here in in a couple of months pretty soon. Dude, not me. You just gotta you just gotta shave it off and 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 live with you know. We might have to. <laughs> we might might have to just get the clippers and do like a military and just shave our heads. But yeah, it's my uh, it's like my my barber gets paid by me um, and, and I get the money, so it's perfect. You know. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> But no, it's uh... okay. So here we go. I knew Nigel was listening, and this is what I wanted to to see him say. He says to remember that during the late heavy bombardment, um, which was yeah, when you know the, the worst part of all the bombardment um, of the moon and the craters and everything, um, he says to remember that um, it wasn't solid. The moon oh, wasn't fully that's solid. True. So. Or it most likely wasn't solid, so we have an impact. It would remelt rock, so like you know, a meteor would hit it, and then it would like kind of flatten because it was semi, you know, liquid underneath or even liquid on top. Who knows? That's pretty cool to think about. I almost thought if I if I could travel back and see a certain event, I'd like to have seen the formation of Earth's moon just from a from amazing. a safe distance, of course. It'd be but amazing. But it, it had to have been pretty dramatic. Oh yeah. I'm going to take and do another imaging run. So if anybody's curious what I'm doing, I'm actually going to record um, about 5,000 frames of, of video using this feed um, that you're seeing, but I'm recording it on the computer. And um, what I'm going to do then later is I'm going to run it through some software that's going to take the sharpest pieces and the sharpest frames from those 5,000, stack them on top of each other, 
and average out all the frames to get rid of um, all the noisy spots. So basically anything that's, um, you know, like when you take your, your camera and put a, a high ISO of it, you see noise. Um, same thing happens yeah. with video cameras. And so what they do is they, sorry about the beep, they, um, they'll show basically it smooths everything out so that you, that you can then sharpen it up and look at the data the the actual image of what's there so the image that we can create from this video feed is actually much 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 better and if you look at my twitter feed and my instagram feed you can see a few of the images um, from two nights ago during um, a live stream event like this where i made imaging um, did the same thing and I, I put a couple out there and i actually finished all those today so i'll be posting those um, either later tonight or tomorrow and um, anyway they look much better than what you're seeing now even though this looks pretty cool uh, it's it gets even better so i know Dave it's strange to think we've been we've been doing image stacking for about 15 years now really yeah, i remember yeah, yeah cool. it's i think in 2003 or 4 i started i, I read an article and sky and telescope and it's like i realized webcam telescope laptop free software like registax it's like i have everything to do this so i just i set it up and started doing it that was like oh three oh four that image stacking's been around that long so yeah i guess i mean i'm i'm i still use a program called auto stackert um and yeah i've heard of it. i've never used it but i've heard of it it hasn't it hasn't been updated for years and years and years because it's basically okay it does yeah. what we want it to do and we don't mess around with it anymore so i'm gonna i'm gonna go ahead and put this on here. there used to be one called k3 ccd tools that i used to use that i remember like that one i remember that one yeah. as well yeah. yeah i don't know if that exists anymore i haven't been doing it for a while but registax <laughs> was a was was a common one that everybody used well k3 ccd tools was open source so i'm sure it's still around you know i don't know yeah. if it's been updated or anything but um, I'm going to go ahead and let you go, Dave, and um, I'm, also, right. I'm also just going to close up shop because I've pretty much done everything I wanted to do tonight, and we've been on for two hours, so um, everybody that's I'll watched. be on the weekly Space Hangout with Universe today, tomorrow night as well. So. Oh, wait, okay, yeah, so Google the yeah, weekly Space Hangout, and it's, um, is it video like this as well, I assume? Well, yeah, yeah, still yeah, doing yeah. That. we do, we do some meetings. It's been years. Yeah, we've been doing that as long as the ver we did that back in the Google Hangout stage. Yeah. We started doing that as well, and we've now it's progressed over to uh, Zoom meetings like this into YouTube. So, mm. but Frazier does all that. I just do the words; he does the technical stuff. <laughs> no, it's cool. It's always good having another um, uh, another person in here, and especially someone with your knowledge and everything. So, thanks a lot, Dave, for yeah. for yeah, joining no me. And um, anybody has any, any questions for either me or Dave, just look us up on Twitter or, or Instagram or um, even YouTube if you want. Um, and, yeah, ask us questions or whatever. We'll, I'll be back up on here again. Dave will maybe join me again. And uh, see, maybe we can get uh, Frazier on for one of them. I know um, he said he was busy today, so he wasn't able to do it. I'm pretty sure he was just blowing me off, but that's fine. Yeah, <laughs> he's home. He has nothing to do. <laughs> <laughs> nah, it's cool. So cheers, everybody. Thanks for joining. And um, yeah, here's that. I'll just leave you with that beautiful view of the moon as if you were an astronaut about to land. So All enjoy. Right. All right. Cheers, Dave. Take it easy. All right. Bye.